Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you, Dina. Thank you. Um, meeting you has definitely changed my life um, for oh. the better, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, I love what you're doing. I love the platform. I'm a fan of your social media, and I'm, I, I think you're doing really important work around many things, right? I mean, around domestic abuse, divorce, life changes, and even touching on stories of recovery. It's but thank you, Dana. I, uh, I think you do an amazing job from what I've seen, and I've watched a few of your podcasts, and I've done a lot of podcasts and that, and you let people, it just, people just talk. It flows out of them. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dina Court. I'm the publisher of Divorce Magazine Canada and Life Changes Magazine, and we also host online support groups. Every two weeks, you can meet our experts and ask questions and learn information that will help you wherever you might be stuck or struggling through any type of a major life change, including divorce, which is the main topic that we, we really do uh, spend a lot of time on. Now, today we're not talking so much about divorce, but my special guest, Dr. Kimberly Fraser, who is a nurse educator and an author, a yogi, she's a lot of things. She's accomplished a lot in her life. And yet, when she faced becoming a caregiver around helping support her aging parents, it was a challenge. And it's something that we can't necessarily uh, predict how that is going to affect our lives. We don't know at what point that could happen. It could happen sooner than you expect. Where are you in your own personal life? All these challenges seem to come together. And, it, you know, it's good to really understand what some of those challenges might be and have the conversations with your parents or you know, sort out uh, how you might want to deal with that when the time comes. This is an interesting space that a lot of we a lot of us are facing in this time of you know in middle age and later middle age <laughs> I want to say because I think that's changed over the years where we feel that that falls and it's a life change that is happening for our parents or someone else that we care about where we are in that type of a role and it's a life change for us because it does affect our lives as well so I'm really happy to bring Kim to you and have this conversation. Now, we also have online support groups. There's the magazines that I publish, Divorce Magazine Canada and Life Changes Magazine. Please be sure and check those out. We have a YouTube channel. You can watch this on our YouTube channel so you can see the video if you'd like to. All of the links that we talk about will be in the show notes, so please be sure and check those out. Okay, let's meet Kim now. I'm really excited to bring to you a friend of mine who has done some amazing work in her life and she keeps feeling called to, to go down other paths and other routes. And she's going to share with you today, some of the wisdom that she's gained in life and of what she offers to help support you as well. And there's some significant life changes that you've experienced, Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here and sharing what you've learned so far and where we can find more of that um, like in your book for instance welcome great tell well us... thanks for having me oh it's my pleasure please tell us what brought you to where you are now and pursuing the work that you are pursuing because you've you've definitely specialized we we both come from i'm gonna here's a little um hint for everybody we both came from nursing backgrounds but what kim has done and she's taken this She's taken this to next levels. Well, thanks, Dina. And I didn't realize you came from, from a nursing background. So that'll be a conversation for someday. Yes. <laughs> but Well, and that's the beauty of nursing, I, I guess. I, nursing is definitely my foundation. And without that, I'm not sure that I'd be here. So I'll preface my life with that. So yeah, I've been a nurse entrepreneur, which is really unique. I have always blazed my own path and uh, did not ever have a traditional uh, nursing career or trajectory. And I certainly didn't ever, ever have it all planned out. Um, but I am a planner and I set goals and I work very hard 
but I like to think I leave capacity to embrace the unknown or those little things that come up along the way. And so um, after nursing entrepreneurship, running a very large home healthcare company, one of the largest in Canada, um, actually, and we sold it in 2014 or 15 with 500 staff. So certainly learned lots of challenges along the way. Before we sold it, I, my husband is my business partner and I just, I've always been a teacher at heart. And I previously taught nursing prior to my entrepreneurship days. And so went back and did a PhD in nursing. My master's is in health education and health promotion. So I've always been interested in health and well-being. And I just had this strong tie to go back and do a PhD and become a nurse researcher. So with the big support of my husband, I did that and stayed at the U of A and retired from that career. I guess I was a professor, um, a tenured professor for about 10 years and retired, but kept teaching at Athabasca. I retired and I left early, one would say. I loved my job. I've loved every aspect of my nursing career. Um, but I always took on a change because of a bigger dream, I guess. And my research was in home care, aging, aging well, health policy, and family caregiving. And I believed while my work was important, the only people really accessing it were academics, nursing students, those kinds of things until we get out in the world and translate that knowledge for the larger public. And my PhD and a large part of my research is embedded in knowledge translation, evidence-based decision-making and evidence-based policy. But if the people I want to reach don't know about the work I've been doing and what the research is saying, why would I think that they would use it? And I believed family caregivers, I love health systems research and work, but I love supporting individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis the most. That's what gives me the greatest personal satisfaction. So I retired early to write my book, The Accidental Caregiver. And we can, I'm sure you'll have links afterward where people yes. can find that. It's available broadly at any bookstore. Um, and then I went on to write something called The Care Book, which is... Um, uh, a, a workbook that people can work through their own um, their own case and essentially build their own care plan in the home and keep it handy and they can have it in a binder or they can have it in this little workbook but that's kind of where I went and did I do this alone no I actually took a master's in a master's degree in creative nonfiction at King's University out in Halifax it's King's is affiliated with Dalhousie and that's one of my Alma matters for both my um, undergrad nursing degree and my master's in health ed and promotion. So I have lots of academic articles. I have about a hundred peer reviewed publications and book chapters and academic presses, but I did not know how to write a book. So <laughs> I love learning. I went back to school. So yes, lots of life changes. So I'll leave it at that. What really resonates with me, Kim, is that you not only love to teach, you love to learn. Mm -hmm. And it really shows how that lights you up. What is so beautiful about all of this, it's culminated in a very practical, tangible piece of work. Well, two pieces of work that you just demonstrated that help the, the, the people out there that are really struggling on a day to day basis and don't know where to turn don't know and I love the title, An Accidental Caregiver, you don't necessarily anticipate that that is going to be a role you'll play in the future for mm -hmm. a family member or a loved one, somebody you care about, mm -hmm. and that you've given these them these tools that they can, even the, the workbook that they can take and use to mm -hmm. be the best caregiver, understand they aren't alone, and that this is a life change that they are now supporting someone through. And if they feel supported as they support others, everyone comes out of this in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more of a gift than a burden that they are offering. 
Mm -hmm. That's just my view of, of what I'm feeling your mission is with this work. Absolutely. There's definitely um, an upside to caregiving. Those of us who have been a family caregiver um, develop a very up close and personal relationship with family or friends um, and it's typically somebody out of a family, one of your siblings, whomever, somebody always steps up to be the lead, but often it's a whole team of people doing it. So in my book, it's a narrative that anybody would find interesting, says the author, um, <laughs> because it's it's not like a textbook and it's not a, it's not a how to in terms of prescriptive, but there's tons of lessons. There's about nine families represented in my book, one of whom is my mom. Who looked after my dad for 21 years. He died of MS at home. He was diagnosed at 43 with four young children. I was the oldest at 18, just starting nursing. My mom was an RN, retired early to continue to look after him. And he died at home 21 years later. And he had, there's different kinds of MS and there's lots of debilitating chronic diseases, but MS you know, there's varying degrees. My dad had the worst kind, which is a primary progressive, which is a straight downhill slope with um, assistance from medical professionals and medications all along the way to keep him as well as he could be for 21 years. So that's my personal story of what led me there. As the book is going to print, my husband gets diagnosed with a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. He's well, we're coming up to five years and he's... Um, very healthy. And we had an awesome medical team. But I wrote this book, he gets this diagnosis. And it really, I immediately thought, Oh, my gosh, I wanted to share this work with other people. I did not want to live this myself. Even though my dad had MS, my mother was his primary caregiver. All of us siblings, we were her support team, we stepped in and did what he could. But by the end of dad's um disease he choked we i'm a nurse my i have other sisters who are nurses and my sister-in-law we have a great team and a lot of people but my mom was the only one who could really take that two hours for each meal and actually get food into dad without choking him so you have the primary caregiver and then you have the larger community who can support those in our life who we know are caregivers. So my book really gives practical advice on how to support those people. But getting back to my husband, I was really put to the test. Is what I said in my book true? Does it help me? And uh, honestly, it absolutely did. But it is accidental. You're never prepared for for going into that role. So while my husband lived this and had to have the surgery and whatnot, um, and we all have different strengths, he didn't wanna peruse the literature. That's what I do. I, I take a deep dive. I talk to the medical professionals. I get his lab results. I make sure I study them inside and out. And the beauty of healthcare today, sure I'm a nurse and I know what to do, but everybody knows nurses or some other health professional or ask your own health provider for help. I said to our specialist, I said, okay, tell me where to look because I'm going on the internet and I am an academic and I'm going into the databases. So he said, yeah, don't do that, Kim. Here, <laughs> he gave me two public databases that anybody can go to for patients and family members. And he you know, gave me advice about the literature because as you know, if you've ever had something wrong with you or your family, we self-diagnose, we go down rabbit holes, and there is a lot, a lot, a lot of BS on the internet mm -hmm. or, and it's not all misaligned. You need to be astute to be able to assess the information in terms of what pertains to you. What is your specific situation, diagnosis, et cetera. But healthcare today, you can get your lab test. There's patient help sites and family caregiver help sites that tell you how to interpret them and understand them for your for your own self, because I think we always wonder, okay, if you're like me, do I have all the goods and nothing but the goods? I want to fully understand this. So my role was really that information sourcing and interpretate, interpreting things back to my husband. I for sure had an advantage in terms of what treatment we should take because I study how we make clinical decisions, but anybody can learn that and your health professionals will help you. But that's in layman's terms, 
told from the perspective of family members. And yes, there is an afterword in my book about my husband's and my journey, um, even in how to tell our 19 year old son at the time. And then you think about, oh my gosh, this is so hereditary. What are my son's chances? How do we interpret this for him? So my story is the last bit in this book. And I don't know, serendipity is amazing. Thank you for sharing that because when when we do talk about things that are close to our heart, like you say, this was a beautiful gift that you were offering to people. This was close to your heart to take care of people in this way by offering insights you'd gained from research you'd done, but put it in the hands of the people who really needed it, not just the ones that were curious to learn more about it. And then when you experience it's like whoa wait um I'm not really why me and then yeah. for you to wrap the book up with that um personal perspective of what it's like to journey that way yourself now would that be what what were some of the other challenges that you've come across as you've been deep into this work um well, writing a book, I, you're an author. Uh, so I left my career that I loved, which I still have a baby toe in teaching health policy at Athabasca. And I can't say that I will never go back to academia, but I left to live a more creative life. I wanted to do more yoga. I'm, if you saw the room I'm in, I'm in my studio. It looks nice and tidy behind me. It's where I do my <laughs> yoga and my yeah. Zoom yoga classes. Um, but I have my writing studio on that end. I've got my sewing machine right behind my laptop. So I'm very much a creative. I do lots of crazy things. Just made these earrings for my sister with a necklace Lovely. that matches. Lovely. Okay, everybody's got to jump on the YouTube videos because you need to see these visuals that Kim's sharing. Um, so yeah, so the are challenges. those are those ways that have now I'm good, sorry I'm going to jump in here because mm. are those are those things that you found help keep you you grounded to help help you deal with whether it was your husband's health or the transitions that you faced and then the challenges that you're going to share. Yeah, absolutely. I we all need creative outlets and even through the thick of family caregiving you or or any major change, whether it's divorce, adopting a new child into your family, a pet dying, uh, changing jobs, either um, on your own terms or forced upon you. There are significant life changes. And I personally have come to know with all my heart and soul that you still need to protect you, that inner inner you, what makes you you and embrace that mostly maybe creative side, go for a walk, go out in nature. For me, there's nothing more uh, relaxing than counting beads. So I don't really <laughs> count them, but I, you know, work with them through color. I'll have something laid out that I'm making or working on a up style denim jacket. I'll have the pieces laid out. I don't know, know where it's going, but I have to sleep on it. And I, I'll get back to it when it, when it comes, but um, I believe we all need that creative, um, ascetic outlet to give us a reprieve to go inside and have quiet the mind so we can reflect on the situation and fill our cup back up so we can continue the tough work of life, whatever that might be. Right. And so... Um, I've always been creative, but I let it go. Building our business, as you know, building a business, time for little else, young family, um, making a living, thinking about retirement. How am I going to plan? You know, um, I worked, we worked, my husband and I, 16, 18 hour days often, but we always had balance. Yes, I work hard and I put out, but if I don't take a couple of days in that week to do the eight hour, 10 hour day and and have time for a walk, we're going to implode because nobody can go at full steam forever. We, our bodies aren't built like that. So while I worked hard and I have an article coming out in an anthology um, about, it's called Bad Artist, or that might not be the title now, but <laughs> it's about how we create 
within the throes of life. And I'm a great procrastinator, but people would always ask me, when do you, do you sleep first? They'd say, do you sleep? I'm like, yeah, I sleep great. I, I have about seven to eight hours of sleep every night. I love to sleep, but I just like to create as well. But for me, even doing my some of my research, even in my PhD, where there was mountains of reading, mountains of things to um, analyze, I that's when I took up jewelry making and I really got back into my creativity was, I guess, when I started my PhD, because I'd always been creative, but we let it go. And one of my teachers said, if you don't let your creativity come out and whatever, maybe you're a baker, uh, maybe you like to read and think, you draw, who knows? We all have different ways we express our own personal creativity. Maybe it's styling clothing. Um, if we suppress that, we'll eventually get sick because we're not exercising that part of our body. And so sick is a broad term in the way she right. said it you know, mentally unwell, frustrated, angry, things will come out that we might not, we won't be our best self. And for me, that was true. And working so hard in my PhD and, and uh, analyzing work and data that was in front of me, and even my own research, I found that when I slowed down to write something creative, a play with poetry, I started doing some poetry at that time, just looking at some of the words on the page and thinking about them differently, new insights come in. When I'm sitting making jewelry, new insights come in. When I can't figure out what looks good together or I'm not happy with the design, I leave it. I might go make supper or bake a cake or, or go back to my research. You know, when we let things in, they come in, but we need room for that to come in. And that's part of that balance and letting things go. So it's probably a large part of the way I cope with all of my, you know, busy life. But um, we're not we're not little pieces. And so when we talk about one of the challenges in some of these life changes, when I left my career, my full time career to pursue other things like writing on a more full time basis, it took a lot because my identity was wrapped up as an, in a nurse researcher, nurse entrepreneur busy uh executive um so i i had to let that go to let more of the other come in and i remember talking to a friend of mine who's a branding expert and i i had a meeting with him i'm like okay i don't want to be one of these women that go, uh, that goes out to a networking event and gives people two three four business cards who is kim fraser because then I, how do I trade? Like I was going to, you know, I was a yoga teacher and, you know, a writer and I meld those two things together in practices. So who, how do I, so I've spent a lot of time figuring out what do I do? Do I still say Kim Fraser nurse? You know, so, because I think that's really important that we know what our identity is because if we want people to interact with us, or maybe hire us for that volunteer position on a board or support them in some way, whether paid or not, we have to know who we are. So how am I going to present myself to the world no longer being that nurse executive or nurse researcher or more than an author? What does an author have to offer the masses, which I guess is a little bit about what we're talking about. How does this package come together? So, um, so it, I, he gave me a few exercises to do on my own and eventually it came, but, and I think anybody, so that's my story, but I think anybody going into phase two or phase three of their adulthood, when they're shifting careers, because many of us, retirement is such an old uh, value laden term. What does that even mean anymore? And those of us going into a life change, we need to think about those things. We need to know the path we're on. We might not have everything figured out when we make the change, but we certainly need to spend time on ourselves trying to make that fit with who we are 
and this new way. And it doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing. People are very hard on themselves. Oh, look at me. I'm on my third career. Well, great. Great. <laughs> what, are you, what are you learning? That's fantastic. And maybe that's just because I do love change. I've studied change on an individual and an organizational level. I've taught it, but I've always embraced it even before I understood what I was going through. And that's part of my new, my memoir that I'm working on. I was a young nurse up in the North. And my mother was like, why do you want to do that? Like I was 21, just got my RN. And this was just before I, I was just starting my post RN at the time. So I had a diploma and then did a post RN degree at Dow. And uh, it was a way I funded my education. And mom was and dad were, well, we'll help you. You don't need to do that. And I'm like, I want to do that. So I was flying off to the North, <laughs> just figuring my way. And I just, I was that girl that went on blind dates. Friends would say, hey, I got this guy friend. You know, he's really nice. Would you want to go out with him? So I'd have lots of blind dates and you know, not really for any any other reason other than to meet people or for a lark. And, you know, I met some really nice fellows doing that. And people, how come you, how can you do that? <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just wired differently, I guess. <laughs> I think you're the epitome of what I really admire that you face life with curiosity and not judgment. That might be a good way to put it. I try. It's very hard for us not to be judgy, but yes, it's, it's really important to, yeah, let things come in again. And I want to really emphasize and, and, and put a spotlight on something that you said, how important it is that we think about who we are, because we do get hung up on job titles, career accomplishments, you know, that type, but who are we? And, and a lot of people are, I feel they decline so rapidly when they do retire like that old paradigm. Um, and then who am I, I mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. am I contributing to society? I'm not this anymore. And I don't know who I am. So mm -hmm. to be mentally prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like what you say, like it is arch archaic now retirement. Isn't just, okay. Urge stop end of career, career. Right. like be creative. What really calls you? Who are you? What, what dreams have you had? Or do you have new ones? Great. Mm -hmm. Let like get curious, explore them, try these different things. So I really, I, I respect the path that you've taken and how you just, you know, you'd be curious. Okay. Well then is there education around that? You know, mm -hmm. I've written all I've written and been published, but I haven't written a book. Okay, right. well, how can I learn to do that better so that I feel I'm ready to take that challenge on and mm -hmm. and look what you've created. I'm really mm -hmm. excited to see what else that you are doing. This memoir, <laughs> you just kind of dropped that in there. There's a memoir coming. Yeah, there's a memoir coming and a historical nonfiction on a small regional airport here in Alberta that's actually Canada's oldest operating airport that's still functioning, run by volunteers. And it's thriving. So Cooking Lake Airport. So I'm working, I was just at the archives and yeah, it's just so much fun. There's so much to learn and explore. I mean, yeah, I guess that's probably what keeps me going is a, a, a very curious mind about, and it's fun, things I know nothing about because quite frankly, I get bored. I think most of us get bored telling our same spiel over and over and over again, the same work, the same research. That's why I think you see researchers, okay, that study's done, that's gone now, they're onto something new. And then people find the old research and want to talk about it. I'm, just, I'm I've got a woman I have to connect with today who's asking me about some former work. And so she's asked me questions that I have to go, is that still true? Because new evidence it's, come out yes. all the time. So, if she needs advice, I have to look at my work, my old work that is like a slog, but yeah. I'm thrilled that <laughs> someone cares enough. Yes. So, you know, so that curiosity, it's what, I guess it probably is one of the things that propels me. I appreciate you sharing with us some insights into what you've experienced personally, academically, and where you are still very drawn 
to create more. I love how you've encouraged us to make space for our creative sides and how that actually enhances what we offer to the world because we're not putting, we get inspiration by allowing the inspiration to be creative. And then it just expands on everything else in our lives. And I can attest to that too. I, I, and I feel called out because well said. <laughs> I need to make more space myself for those creative things because I'm feeling that I'm feeling it pushing back mm-hmm. and going, uh, hello, what mm-hmm. about this? What about mm-hmm. that? Um, you know, and I find if I do a simple thing like a walk or just step out into the yard and get into nature mm-hmm. and then I'll have the most brilliant idea all of a sudden pop into my head when I'm not even thinking about it. So uh, thank you for what you've created for people so far. We will have links for people to be able to contact you and find your books and follow your work and, you know, see what else there is that can help them through life changes and, and the challenges that they may accidentally discover are going to be part of their life. And Um, And I just, Mm -hmm. I want to say here too, that I am so grateful to the caregivers out there who have taken on those roles, whether Mm -hmm. they did it by choice or, you know, accidentally, there's nobody Mm -hmm. else. And so Mm -hmm. it becomes uh, something that is going to kind of take over their life in some ways for a time. And Mm -hmm. I just really, really am grateful for those who do that. And, and, and for the work of of people like you kim dr kim mm-hmm. i apologize yeah, no, uh, you that's are, fine yep always and kim always kim i love that very approachable and we will share all of this information we're going to have you back because we want to dig in and offer people even some you know quick tips for if you find yourself struggling with this particular part mm-hmm. of caregiving today here's absolutely. something that, that could help mm-hmm. you so absolutely yeah. I'd love that. Thank you so much. And yes, I'll share some links. And and if people are feeling overwhelmed by something that we might have said in terms of, it just dawned on me now, um, how do I slow down? How do I reflect? Sometimes people don't know how to even begin. Um, I do have some up and coming yoga classes that's yoga and journaling, self-reflective coming up. So I'll share that afterward. And maybe you can put it in your link through park yoga and wellness in Sherwood Park at the end of May. So that might be something if people are overwhelmed and thinking, I don't even know where to start. It's a session that can help quiet the mind, tap into the body and give you some time to reflect and get things on paper. Um, You know, and everybody's experience will be different, but it will be guided. So we can, and we can do a session on that someday. Yes. (laughs) Yes, that would be fun. We could actually do an episode that Mm -hmm. people could listen to and do in their homes on their own time. Absolutely. Oh, that's brilliant. See, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you just can't help yourself. You just are. I just, it just goes. (laughs) I love it. Okay. Thank you for your time today, Kim. And I really appreciate you. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're doing great work. So keep it up. Really important. Thank you. I hope you found that conversation insightful, encouraging, and also a reminder to all of us that what we see isn't always as it appears. People are going through a lot of things in their lives and we would want that compassion shared to us. And that is something that we can offer to others without judgment. Instead, be curious and and reach out, reach in, figure out a way that you can make someone's day a little better and it might just start with a smile. I thank you very much for spending your time with me here today and encourage you to please subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media, check out our events. We have lots of ways that we can help you or someone that you love. Share this with a friend if there's someone that you know could benefit from this and hey, keep smiling that beautiful smile because the world really does need your sunshine. It means a lot that you spend this time with us and meet our experts and professionals who can help you through whatever life changes you're facing. Please refer to our terms of service available on our website, lifechangesmag.com. The link is in the show notes. Our disclaimer, Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes, 
magazine, and channel, and divorce resource groups are intended to educate and provide quality, credible resource information. The contents should not be used as factual until consultation with the appropriate professionals for any guidance. Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine, and Life Changes Channel, as well as the divorce resource groups, do not constitute endorsements for, nor liability, for any claims made in the presenting of this information.